Hello everybody, welcome, uh, happy new year. Welcome for this uh, new uh, uh, several year of uh, and we have the pleasure to welcome Emma to talk about optimal balance for the no show paradox. Yes, that's all. Okay, thank you, Francois. Um, just can someone confirm me that uh, you can hear me well on the bridge? Yes, it's fine. Perfect. So thank you for attending my speech. Um, today I'm going to talk about optimal bounds for the no-show paradox via set solving. And first, um, I'm going to explain what's the no-show paradox. And before explaining it, um, let me just remind you what is a voting rule because the no-show paradox uh, concerns voting rules. So here is a um, little drawing that explains uh, what it is. So you have um, people right here, they are called the voters, and they have preferences uh, among some candidates. And here, um, this function right here takes the preferences into account and returns a winner. So this edge right here is um, what is a voting rule. So now some vocabulary. During all the talk, M will be the number of candidates and N will be the number of voters. And each voter has strict preferences over the candidates. So we consider that each voter is able to rank the candidate in a total order. And the set of preferences will be called a profile. So now um, I'm going to tell you a little story that is in this article of Fishburne and Brahms. And that is an example of the no-show paradox. So in the article, we have Mrs. and Mr. Smith, and they are going to vote for their local government election. And in their town, the voting system used is IRV, also known as STV. And so I'm going to explain you how IRV proceeds to elect a winner. Um, so in our situation, we'll have three candidates, Mr. B, Mrs. H, and Dr. W. And uh, in this system, the ballot looks like this, like a ranking. So for example, Mrs. and Mr. Smith, they prefer B over, over H over W. So their ballot, they will put um, B first, then H, then W. So once you have collected all the ballots with all the ranking, you do the IRV procedure. So first, if there is a candidate that appears on top of a majority of ballots, you elect this candidate and stop. So for example, if you have um, six voters and you have a candidate that appears on the top of the rankings of four ballots, this candidate will be um, elected. Otherwise, what you do is you eliminate the candidate appearing as the first preference on the fewest ballots and you update the profiles. We will see later how we update the profiles in an example, so I'm not gonna take long on this, but basically you remove the, the candidate that is eliminated and you update the profiles accordingly. Okay, if only one candidate remains, you elect this candidate and stop. So for example, if you have uh, only two candidates and one is eliminated in the step two, of course, you only have one candidate remaining and this one is elected. And if, you, if, uh, if after the step two, um, you have more than one candidate, you just go to one again and you reiterate the IRV procedure until you have only one candidate remaining. Okay, so that's for the IRV procedure. Now, a small reminder, we have three candidates and here is Mrs. and Mr. Smith preference, so B, H, and W. So they are on their way to the polls and they are in their car and unfortunately, the car broke. So um, they try to fix the car, it doesn't work, and the end uh, of the day um, appears, and so they didn't have the chance to go to the polls and to vote. And Mrs. Smith is really sad about this, and the day after, she looks at the results. So here are how the people voted. So we have this number of people in total, and this, this is the vote without uh, the Smith uh, vote. Uh, so this is a profile without the Smith vote because they couldn't vote. Um, so here you can see that you have 499 people 
who have B as the first preference, 500 who have H as the first preference, and 609 who have W as first preference. So no candidate has a majority of vote uh, for the first place. So we need to eliminate a candidate. And here the candidate that will be eliminated then is B because it has the fewest vote as the first preference. So we are going to, sorry, we're going to eliminate B and report the voting here and here accordingly. So here you can see that um, all those people, the people that prefer H to W, so all these 417 people, we are going to add to all these prefer uh, people who prefer H over W. And here, these 82 prefer people that prefer W over H, so they are going to be add added to those people right here who prefer W to H. Okay, so we update the profile accordingly and we have this. And now we can see that H is preferred to W more times than W is preferred to H. So then H is elected. So here the results of the poll is that H is elected, W is second, and B is third. And here is um, the Smith preference. So they preferred B, but B was not elected, and H was elected. So their second choice was elected. And then Mrs. Smith wants to know what would have happened if she and her husband could have, have voted. So she changes the polls and she just adds her vote and her husband's vote to here, the four and 17 people. So now we have this number of voters. So this is the profile if the Smith could have voted. Now we have 501 people who have B as the first preference. 500 who have age as a first preference, and 609 people who have W as first preference. So again, no majority, we need to eliminate the candidate that has the fewest votes as the first place. And this time it's age. So we are going to eliminate age. And those people right here, they prefer B over W. So they are going to be added to those people. And here, this 3,005 but these 357 people, they are going to be added to those people. So now we update the profile and we can see that this time W is preferred to B more times that B is preferred to W. And so this time, um, so here is without voting, this time W is elected. So you can, you can see that by adding the Smith vote, um, the result of the polls changed. And what is surprising here is that they preferred B over H over W, but by going to vote, the, um, the results got worse for them because in the first place, when they didn't vote, H was elected. And when they vote, the candidate that pre they prefer the worst is elected. So here you can see that even if their favorite candidate did slightly better when they went voting, the, um, the important reason, the result, which is the winner of the election, um, got worse for them. And that's what we call the no-show paradox. So the no-show paradox is when, um, uh, so a voting rule generates the no-show paradox is if a voter may be better off no voting than casting a sincere ballot. So this is exactly what happened here for the scene. And uh, the contrary of the no-show paradox is what we call the participation criterion. So a voting rule satisfy the participation criterion if the addition of a ballot where the current winner A is preferred to a candidate B does not make B win. So it, it's really just the contrary of this. Um, okay, so now we could see some easy examples of rule that satisfy participation. Um, do you have any idea of a rule that could satisfy um, participation criterion? A very easy rule in the room or on the bridge. Okay, so. <laughs> 
Oh, okay. Yes, plurality. <laughs> so um, for those who don't know plurality, you just put your favorite candidate as a ballot, and then um, you elect the candidate that has uh, the most uh, votes. So of course, in this system, you can easily um, have the intuition that uh, it's going to satisfy participation, because um, if you participate sincerely, your favorite candidate will have more chances to win. Um, can you see um, um, uh, another rule that looks like plurality that could satisfy participation? Uh, yes, approval voting. So, <laughs> approval voting is just you, you have it in the good order. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> Instead of um, putting only one name in the ballot, you put several candidates that you approve, and again with the same intuition, you can see that it satisfies participation. Uh, there's another one, maybe a bit more complicated. Which one? Um, no. I think, yeah, maybe. It's not the one I wrote. The, the one I wrote Boda, is yes. Boda. So in Boda, you <laughs> just um, put a ranking and um, every ranking will have a, a grade. So the first one will have the maximum grade, the second one will have uh, a grade slightly uh, lower, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, okay, so now rules that do not satisfy participation. You know one. Yes, <laughs> IRE does not satisfy participation for what we saw uh, before. Um, do you know another one? It's a bit harder to find rules that do not satisfy participation because they tend to be more complex, actually. So another one is majority judgment. Um, so majority ju judgment, uh, basically you just um, say um, how you judge the candidate. So you say, okay, I think this candidate is excellent. I'm going to tell it's excellent or you have good, you can say it's not good. Um, and then you do some calculation to see how, which candidate has uh, the less bad judgment. And it's a bit more complicated, so I'm not going to elaborate a lot on, on that. And uh, another one is the minimax rule. So in this um, rule, again, it's a more complex rule than the one before. Um, you have a ranking and then you try to find the candidate that loses uh, the less uh, it's a dual against uh, other candidates. So again, these rules are more complex uh, rules. Um, okay, so now we would like to characterize the rules that satisfy participation and the ones that do not. And to give a first characterization, we will have um, we will need the notion of Condorcet extension. So a Condorcet extension is a voting rule that elects the Condorcet winner whenever there is one. And just a reminder, a Condorcet winner is a candidate that um, uh, is preferred to every candidate by a majority of people. Um, okay. And so now that we have this um, definition, we have a theorem uh, found by Moulin in 1987 that says uh, when there is less than three candidates, there exists a Condorcet extension satisfying the participation criterion. So there exists a rule that both satisfies, um, that both elects a Condorcet winner and satisfies the participation criterion. And if M is greater than four, when n is greater than 25, so when there is more than 25 voters, there exists no Condorcet extension satisfying the participation criterion. So because of the point number two, we can deduce that all Condorcet extensions are subject to the no-show paradox. Um, because of course, if it's wrong for n greater than 25, uh, it does not work for n arbitrary. Um, okay, so now, Let's try to give an intuition of the proof for um, this theorem. Um, for the point one, um, the proof will look like just constructing a rule that works. Here are the steps. Uh, I'm going to explain right after um, in detail the steps, but it's just, uh, you can read it if you want, but I will explain it later. Um, okay, so for one, we just need to build a rule that uh, works and then we will have um, the results. 
And for the um, point number two, we need to exhibit a counter example. And by exhibiting counter example, I mean um, uh, showing a profile onto which when you add voters, you will have a contradiction with the, um, the participation criterion. So again, I'm going to explain it right after. Okay, so for number one, we have an electorate N. So this is just uh, uh, electorate means you have people that will vote and U is a profile over N. So it's the people preference. And then we have N, A, B of N, U. Um, so this number right here um, is just uh, a way to calculate if A is preferred to B or B is preferred to A. So here you have the number of people who prefer A to B and here the number of people who prefer B to A. So this is positive if um, A is preferred to B by a majority of people. Then M of A is just the sweep of this quantity. And we will also need this um, in the proof. So this is just a, um, a set. And this is useful because um, you can uh, prove that um, if there is a Condorcet winner A, then this set will be the singleton A. So when a candidate A is a Condorcet winner, we have this. Is it the mini match rule? Uh, is it Sirson Scrabbler or? So, uh, just, uh, just try to understand exactly what, what this rule does. So, uh, I haven't explained the rule yet. Okay. I just defined quantities and okay, a so set. Sorry, so okay. I'm anticipating too much. <laughs> okay. And so now you can see that, for example, any uh, single valued selection of K is Condorcet consistent, so it's a Condorcet extension. Uh, you can prove this, I'm not gonna prove it, it's not uh, what is really important here, but if you take a single value in this set, it will be a Condorcet um, uh, extension. And so now we have practically uh, defined the rule. We just are going to say that the rule selects the first lexicographic element of K. And then this is Condorcet, uh, resistant but by what we have said before and it's also it also satisfy participation um i'm not going to prove that it satisfies participation if you want to see the um, the proof in detail you can look at the article but the idea is that you assume that it does not satisfy participation and then you find a contradiction and to find the contradiction you will use those quantity right here and you will prove that someone some of the quantity is equal to another one and that it's not possible and that's how you find the contradiction okay yes in fact i'm wondering if i understand something badly or there is a typo because and AB, I guess, is the anti-symmetric version of the weighted majority matrix, essentially. Yes. yes. How many people prefer A to B compared to yes, the one that prefers B to A? Uh, so, so that's something that is good for A. But, uh, yeah. And then M, M uh, A is the sub uh, the um, supremum over the Ah, over every a candidate that a is or... preferred uh, to A. Oh. Uh, but maybe, maybe we will touch it at the end. So so it, it, it really be greater than A in the sense of the lexicographic order of the candidates? Um, no, in the sense of... Uh, Majority preference? Um, yes. Okay, yeah, but, but, yeah, which is more natural for me. So, okay, so you, you, you look at all the defeats uh, of A in the weighted majority matrix. Yes. And among these defeats, um, you select the one that is the least uh, strong for A. Yes. Take the, the sub of yes. A. That's so, it. okay. Uh, and so, uh, so, okay, so any, anyway, MA is supposed to be something that is good for A. Uh, I yes. mean, uh, the, the, the greater the MA, the stronger A is. 
And then apparently K in, uh, looks like the arg uh, min of uh, M A. Yes. Uh, but I good. think no. I think here you switched. Uh, yeah. Maybe there's that one. It's N B A. Yeah, yeah. I think. It's I NBA think it's a typo. Because, because so in if, that makes that if M A is small, it's good for A. Okay, and so yeah. So uh, I think I it's N B A here. And in, yeah. yeah. In that case, it's uh, logical yeah. to take the admin. Yeah. And in fact, in that case, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. it's exactly yeah. match. I think there's a typo here. It says it's some kind of. Yeah. I just to say to check if uh, you want to come on seminar, then uh, it's super fancy set, so it's maybe some opportunity. Um, what's your question? When you've got a condensed set, you don't have any big better than A. Yes, that's it. So it's a set of the empty set, so we use infinity. Um, uh, but no, so. No, no, when you have a pharmacy winner, every MV is greater than MA, and it's the only one like that, and so you have a, a single value here. Okay, so that must be a definition of six or a major Yeah, yeah, it's still. Uh, no, I just want to Fabian meant that if, if B has no defeat whatsoever, because A is the condensed winner, yeah. then there, something needs to be uh, explained in the definition of, uh, of MA. Oh, here, because you, you have a it's minus infinity. Yeah. Uh, but in that case, yes, you can uh, yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. yeah. OK, yes. yes. And then, uh, of course, uh, yes. But another way to do it, in fact, take the subtremum. Don't take uh, over, um, on the set of defeats, B over A, you don't care, in fact. Yeah. It could uh, be uh, over all yeah. the candidates. If you take all the all the the pairwise comparisons yeah. of uh, A, then it will give the it, same uh, result. Uh, yeah. So we know it be the only one with the negative. Uh, yes. Okay. Um. So this was for the proof of um the point number one, and so for number two. We will not need only those two things. And we also will need uh, this result, this intermediate result. So if a rule is a Kumasi extension that satisfies participation, then for every um, candidate BA, uh, we will have this implication right here. Uh, I'm not going to prove it, but um, because it's not the point of uh, the talk, but you need to believe me on this, and if you want to see the proof again, I encourage you to read the, the paper the paper by Moulin. Um, okay, so now we can introduce the profile that will work with this and that we will use this on. And so this is this profile. So here we have the profile, and here we have the weighted tournament, uh, the associated weighted tournament. Uh, this drawing is useful because um, those quantity we can read easily on uh, the graph. And so now we can use the result. And so for D, for example, MD is equal to five. So here um, MD is just uh, the minimum of the uh, entering rows uh, to the node D. So here it's five because there's only one. Uh, MB is seven because uh, again, there's, a, there's only one entering a row uh, to the node B and it's of weight seven. And M A is equal to three because both arrows that enter to A are equal to three. And N D B uh, just is the, the edge between D and B. And so it's of weight seven. So here it's equal to seven. And so now uh, we see that uh, here it's the, we have assumed that the number of candidates is greater than 25. So we have this, then B cannot be um, elected by uh, a rule that both satisfy commerce uh, and participation. Same for C and same for D. So here um, with this profile and with a rule that satisfies participation and commerce, um, you will need to elect A. And then if you had, uh, if you had four voters with this preference, by participation, you know that either A must win because before A was the winner, or C must win because uh, C is preferred to A. 
but those two by participation they cannot win and then you use the result the intermediate result again and you find that a rule that satisfy um, condensé and participation cannot elect a or c and then you have a contradiction with the participation criterion ratio and so um, that's how you you prove the points too um, okay, so what we have so far is that we know there exists a condensate extension that satisfies participation for n smaller than 3. We know what there is no condensate extension that satisfies participation for m greater than 4 and n greater than 25. And um, we don't know yet if the bound is 5, right? Because here there is a huge gap between m smaller than three and m greater than four and, and uh, greater than 25. So we would like to refine these results, but the problem is that for the moment, every result by, was found by hand. So by constructing a rule, by constructing a profile, adding some voters. And so it may be um, really difficult to refine this result because um, to find by hand every possible profile that could possibly lead to a contradiction is actually really difficult. So um, a solution to that is to automize, uh, automatize the proof. And that's what uh, Brains, Gates and Peters did in an article of 2016, actually not 17. And they, how they did it is by using SAT solving. So just to recap, uh, a sad problem is just knowing if there's an interpretation that satisfies a given Boolean formula. And um, a Boolean formula can be in what we call conjunctive normal form. So it's a conjunction of one or more clauses, and the clause is a disjunction of lethals. So here I just put example of formula that is not in CNF and one that is in CNF. Um, this is just useful because SAT solvers usually take formulas uh, in CNF. So that's just what I mentioned it. And here um, you can see that uh, if you do the, uh, the transformation, this one and this one are actually equivalent. And um, every um, formula that is not in CNF is convertible in uh, uh, CNF. So we are quite happy with that because we know that we will uh, be able to convert every formula into a CNF and put it in a SAT solver. Okay, so now here is the theorem in their paper. Um, so there is no, there is a condenser, condenser extension that satisfies participation for n is equal to three and n is smaller than eleven, and there is no condenser extension that satisfies participation for m greater than four and n greater than twelve. So this theorem gives a bound and says that it's tight. And so for the sketch of the proof, it will be actually exactly the same as the one before, um, except it's automatized. For, so for the point number one, we will exhibit a condensate extension uh, that works. And Good. for the step number two, we will find a counter example. So a profile that when you add voters uh, will lead to a contradiction. Okay, so how we do this? Um, a first approach could be to genera generate all the profiles P then to introduce um, four variables. So when X uh, PA is true, it means that a rule uh, would elect uh, A when it sees the profile P. So we introduce uh, every possible variable. Um, we introduce uh, the formula to satisfy, um, the, so that the rule needs to satisfy in order to satisfy Condorcet and participation. And we can send it to a SAT solver. Um, unfortunately, this will not work because the number of profile uh, grows exponentially with n. And so the number of variable and clauses we will have uh, would be too big because it grows in theta of 24 to the power of n. So instead, we are going to consider um, the tournaments associated to the profiles because the number of tournaments grows uh, much slower, slower with n than the number of profile. And this is because um, one tournament 
uh, corresponds to several profiles. And so that's why it grows slower, slower and that's why we consider tournaments instead of profiles. Okay, so now let T be a weighted tournament and let A, B, C, D be four candidates. Now we introduce those variables. So again, X, T, A uh, will be set. Uh, if X, T, A is true, it will mean that the rule uh, elects A when it sees the tournament T. And so now we can um, define our conditions. So first we want the rule to elect effectively a winner. So that's why we add this clause. So this just means one of these variables must be true. And so the rule must elect one winner. Um, this clause right here, just say that the winner is uh, unique. Okay. So we cannot have two winners uh, elected by the rule. And now, um, we can define participation. So participation depends here of a ranking. So this will be true if it benefits to someone with this ranking to participate uh, when the current tourna tournament is T, okay? So it looks like this. And here it's Condorcet TA. So here um, Condorcet TA is true when, uh, when A is a, a Condorcet winner, um, the rule will elect A. Okay, so this is um, um, this is um, I don't remember the word in English and in French either, but um, this is I don't anyway, uh, this is depending on the fact that A is uh, supposed to be a winner. And so now that we have our formulas, we can um, uh, build an algorithm that will uh, give us the final set formula to, to solve. So here it's the algorithm, the algorithm that generates the appropriate set formula. So here we have um, the initial tournament and we will build um, uh, other tournaments. So for here, it's uh, the number of voters, so from one to n. <coughs> and so here you can see that we calculate um, uh, the updated tournament when we add uh, a ranking over all possible ranking, and rewrite for every tournament uh, the, con the formulas we uh, defined before. We were we also write uh, participation. And once we have uh, um, uh, computed uh, this algorithm, it will give us a giant SAT formula that has uh, every possible clause to that corresponds to every tournament and every ranking. And here um, we can wonder why we want to keep track of the tournaments. And it's just because um, after we put uh, this formula, this giant formula in the SAT solver, uh, we will need uh, the tournaments to build a nice graph that we will be able to read. Uh, I'm going to explain you later how uh, we are going to do that. So that's why we keep track both of the tournaments and uh, the associated SAT formulas. Okay, so this is an extract of the look at table defining the formal state extension satisfied participation when n is smaller than 11. So we put the formula into the SAT solver and we found that there is indeed, um, the formula is indeed satisfiable when n is, slower than, uh, is lower than uh, 11. So here, um, how to read this? Here we have the candidate that is uh, elected by the rule when the profile looks like this. And here we have the number of uh, voters that um, induced this uh, weighted tournament here. Uh, it's not provided to tournament, sorry. And so the table just gives every possible tournament and uh, every uh, winner associated to the tournament. And so this uh, gives us, a, um, this satisfies the formula we want. Yes, exactly. So the SAT gives you the 
the assignation of the variables that works for the cell formula and then we there's a bit of code to translate it into something that's human readable and that looks like what we have here yeah so the, the sad thing does not try to describe the working scheme it just tries to compile the constraints that you want to describe and then you should find things you find unique solution to give the both yes the, the yes so here again if you look at the logical formulas here you so you just um, um, uh, do the intersection of all these uh, formulas and then you have uh, when you have a, uh, an assignation that satisfies every of these clauses uh, each of these clauses then you have your voting rule because remember um, xta is set true if the rule uh, elects a when t is the tournament so the assignation gives you the rule indeed yes so uh when you go from the profile to the tournament you're mm -hmm. losing some information yes uh how do you know that this information is not important uh, that you don't need this information to decide uh, um, the final? so the by considering tournaments um it implies that you consider pair, pairwise voting systems so systems where where you rank uh, voters and so it restricts the um, the rules you can consider the voting rules you can consider so that's where you lose information just restrict uh, the rules but here it happens that uh, the, this type of rules still uh, work with what we the result we want so in fact uh it showed more than what that was what that what was needed not mm -hmm. only uh, does there exist a condorcet rule mm -hmm. that satisfies participation but there exists a condorcet rule that depends only on the tournament and yeah. that satisfies participation um <laughs> okay so this rule um you have some compatibility with other existing rule um here the maximum uh, rule um so here it's compatible with the maximum rule in 99.8 percent of cases so because it elects maximum winner in uh, this amount of cases um it's also compatible with kemeny uh, rules so kemeny rules you elect a kemeny winner uh, in 98 percent of cases and um, if we argue that this table is too big and that's not really um, um, pleasant to read, um, we here have 80% of the tournaments that have a Kondorcet winner. And so as we have um, uh, supposed that uh, the rule is a Kondorcet extension, we could remove all those tournaments because indeed when we have a commercial winner we know that by uh, the formula that it will be elected so we could remove all these tournaments so that we have a slower slower a shorter table to read yes <clears throat> I cannot understand how this statistics are obtained. So this is on you will uniformly sample your references uh, among these uh, M and M guys. So the, your question is how we know that uh, we have uh, elected the maximum winner in. So this means this means when we have a maximum winner, um, it's uh, elected. Uh, in 19.8 percent of the cases so over all the um, the tournaments here that have a maximum winner 99.8 percent of them uh, were elected uh, okay so he, based on the uniform drawing of the tournament not necessarily a uniform drawing of the profile yes exactly yes ah yes. oh, okay so, so and it's on the uh, yeah, I guess. Yes, because here we have calculated this by looking at the tournaments. Uh, and in the uh, I, I guess that this solution is not unique. Is, is it mentioned in the article? Uh, it's not uh, mentioned if it's unique. It's not mentioned. I, I don't know. I should check. Uh, the, so just to check. The case is it's uh, four million tournaments or the four less than million tournaments. 
Can you repeat your question? But I was much more clear. Yeah. On the all the cases with uh, four elevator, or all cases with four and eleven or less. Eleven or less, because here it's the number of voters here. So you have one, and here you have one eleven. Judge. Okay. And it's just an express of the the table. Um, okay, and so now uh, this is the graphical form of the proof of number two. So before I explain you the graph, I should explain you how they uh, found this. So what they search for when they put um, the SAT formula into the SAT solver was for, uh, they search for what is called a MUS, so a minimal unsatisfiable um, set. And so this is just uh, a set of clauses that together are unsatisfiable. And when you remove only one clauses, it becomes satisfiable. And so um, this set, of course, um, you see here that the variables depend on tournaments. And as we have tracked the tournament, we are able to tell that uh, a set of clauses uh, corresponds to uh, an associated tournament. And so that's why we are able here uh, to build uh, a graph that depends on the tournament. And also uh, they wanted uh, the MUS to be uh, short enough so that the graph is not too big and to concern uh, the least number of different uh, tournaments. And so they explained in the article uh, which uh, algorithm they used um, to find this short uh, MUS. Um, I think the name is Marco. Um, I'm not sure. Yes, it's Marco. The name is Marco. So we can see if you want details on with how they with um, how they found this. Uh, it's written in the article. And so now, how we read um, the the graph. Here we have a profile, and we have an edge that that goes to another profile. And this edge right here says. We have added um, two voters that vote like this. And here you can see that A and B are uh, in green and that they are uh, bold. And this means um, we have considered when added uh, those two voters that in this profile, either A or B uh, were supposed to win. So here, uh, to reach a contradiction, we will to we need to uh, consider all cases. So that's why here we go from this profile and we add it, this considering that either A or B is the winner. And here we do the same, but consider it, considering that either D or C are the winner. So then we do some steps and we arrive to those uh, final tournaments here. And here, for example, if we look at this part of the grid right here. So we have here a profile that is not uh, written, but that you can find by doing the steps. And when you consider from this profile that you add here this uh, voter, uh, and when you go to this profile, by considering that A is the winner, and by add adding this um, vote right here, it makes C win. So this contradicts the participation criterion. And you can see that every here um, tail um, does contradict the participation criterion. And so here, you need to believe me on this, but um, this constru construction is exhaustive. And so this is why uh, it constitutes a contradiction of the fact that um, the, the rule satisfies both Condorcet and participation. Um, okay, do you have any question on this graph? It's just yes, it's the original tournament. Okay, so now a quick uh, recap of what uh, result we have. So here is the result I presented. Um, so here you can see that uh, here it's for m is equal to four. Okay, so this table is for m is equal to four. This is the result I presented. So the result I found by the asset solving. Uh, this is the original result for, by Moulin. Okay, the one I presented in the first class. 
<laughs> and here are other results they obtained with the same method, the same fat solving method. So for a maximum winner, a Kemeny winner. Um, here, um, it's when we consider that uh, we don't have a single winner, but we can have a set of winners. Uh, same here, I think. And so they obtain plenty of uh, tight bounds via their method. Okay. Um, so now for a conclusion, what we have is that now we are able to give tight bounds for the mesh paradox when m is equal to four. Um, we have a human read readable graph thanks to um, their their um, thanks to the way they computed uh, the set solving and the solution. And we have an example of a rule that is highly compatible with existing rules uh, that is both Condorcet and participation consistent when M is uh, slower than is equal to four and so when M is slower than lower than 11. Okay, so what's next? Uh, maybe we would like to find a tight bound for when M is greater than five. Um, the problem with this is that when M gets um, greater than five, then the computation of the SAT formula um, is too big uh, because actually when M is equal to four, it's still manageable, but when you make M grow, it becomes much um, bigger. So it will be a problem to, to solve this with a SAT solver today. And we could also want to have a better understanding of the rule when N is lower than um, is, yes, lower than 11, because here we just have uh, the rule uh, and the assignation for every profile, but maybe we would like to define it in, in a more shorter, in a shorter way. Um, and that's it. Here are the references. So here is the article that do the SAT solving. Um, I encourage you to read it if you want to see more into the details, how they obtain the graph, etc. Uh, here is the article where um, I took the, the explanation of the notion paradox. And here is the article of Moulin. Uh, again, if you want to read it to see more in detail the proof, uh, I encourage you to, to do it. And that's all. Thank you for listening and if you have any questions. Euh, Gérard. J'applaudissais juste. <rire> C'est l'icône pour applaudir. <rire> Merci, Emma. Euh, any questions in the room? Yes. Dans ton théorème, la classification, il y a encore des cas où on ne sait pas. Où ça? Donc, en fait, le théorème, il dit que quand M est plus grand que 4 et N est plus grand que 12, il euh, n'y a pas de règle qui existe. Mais quand M est plus grand que 5, on ne sait pas où, est le, où placer le N pour que ce soit taille. Voilà. Et, donc, parce que dans, dans certains cas, tu arrives à produire la preuve que tu dis, c'est que ton, ton SAT te permettait de construire un système de mais si, 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 si tu n'arrives pas à faire ça, je ne sais pas. C'est-à-dire, c'est ça. Si tu penses que cette approche euh, SAT que tu as, oui. que tu as montré, dans, dans les cas, c'est-à-dire euh, que cette approche-là ne marche pas pour les, pour les cas euh, où on ne sait pas. Euh... Si par les cas où on ne ouais. sait pas, c'est les cas où M est plus grand ouais. et M est plus grand, oui, ça va poser problème parce que justement, la formule SAT va commencer à devenir trop grande et a pu. Euh... Parce qu'en fait, là, on était juste à la limite de ce qui est possible en termes de formule SAT, en termes de taille. Et quand M devient plus grand, ça devient compliqué à gérer. La formule devient vraiment beaucoup trop grande. En fait. Et le solver met trop de temps en fait, à, à résoudre le truc et ça ne ça donne jamais résoudre. D'accord. Donc, c'est juste la puissance de calcul qui, ça. qui pose problème. Oui, exactement. Ce n'est pas nécessairement la méthode. Oui, de... c'est ça. Alors, je dis, du coup, on sait quand même quelque chose. C'est qu'à partir de M égale 5, la borne elle est nécessairement inférieure ou égale à 12. Oui. Ça, on sait. Ah, ça, ça, ah, ça, le truc, c'est que si tu regardes, ouais. par exemple, tu 
prends les profils à cinq candidats, tu prends tous les profils où le candidat, eux, il est unanimement détesté par tout le monde, je ne peux pas refaire la même chose. Oui, c'est ça. En fait, sur ce, sur ce graphe, on peut rajouter plein de candidats ici qui sont, qui sont à la fin du classement et ça marche quand même comme preuve. Et comment ça se fait que ce soit aussi bizarre euh, alors après dans l'article ils disent pas si celui-là est unique si c'est le plus petit ils disent juste qu'ils ont trouvé celui-là donc peut-être qu'il en existe des moins euh, des moins grands des graphes et des plus voilà. euh, notamment dans l'article pour euh, pour Maximine et Kemeni ils trouvent des graphes qui sont bien plus petits et plus symétriques plus euh, plus agréables à lire oui, c'est voilà. la différence quand même entre justement Maximine, Kemeni et Condorcier, c'est que que tu prends donc, Maximine, en fait, ça veut dire que c'est un truc qui te fixe le vainqueur dans presque tous les cas, si tu veux. Et du coup, il y a quelque chose à regarder. Tu, tu tombes très vite sur des contradictions parce que tu as déjà beaucoup de contrats. Alors que si tu demandes juste un autre système de vote vers des régimes condorcés, tu as énormément de liberté parce que ça ne dit pas ce que tu dois faire dans tous les cas où il n'y a pas. Ça, en tout cas, ça donne un peu une idée de pourquoi la preuve est plus simple dans le cas des Kemeni et le winner que dans le cas des Condensés et Sinon, bon, la question quand oui, mm -hmm. est-ce que dans l'article, ils disent qu'il y a toujours raison de donner pour euh, avoir le résultat ou... euh, Donc, le temps qu'ils ont mis, je crois que c'est 6h30 pour trouver la formule, la règle qui marche. Et après, pour le MUS, je ne sais plus. Alors. Ah, là, il est 50 minutes. Et la moitié du temps est passée à parser la formule. Ça veut juste dire. Euh, voilà. Non, parsing de formule. Ah, vraiment parser. Ouais, voilà. Est-ce que, est que ça suggère que le variage de condensé et de, 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 de participation. participation est un truc de... Donc, est-ce que les deux sont souhaitables, à vrai dire euh... Vers, en fait. Mais, mais, mais c'est ça. Oui, oui, oui c'est des trucs. Ça marche pas. Après, ici, on cherche les cas qui pathologique, euh, mais on pourrait aussi regarder si on suppose que les deux sont en quoi, parce que ça arrive souvent, euh, si on tue en sur trois, si on tue en En fait, moi, le, un peu la façon dont je le verrais, c'est que les, les, les préférences collectives, elles n'ont pas envie d'être transmises. Ouais, c'est ça que es, je, je vais expliquer. Euh, si, tu, si tu prends les préférences des gens, ben c'est des relations. Euh, Binaire, donc tu peux supposer éventuellement que c'est des ordres. Très bien. Euh, si, tu prends, si tu prends toutes ces relations, je prends leur matrice, ça te donne une matrice qui ressemble à celle de Eman de Nicolas. Et tu peux, tu peux faire une relation binaire assez naturelle, qui est la relation majoritaire. Quoi. Bon, il se trouve que cette relation-là, même si les relations individuelles sont transmissibles, elle n'a aucune raison d'être transmissible. Et, euh, alors, le, le, le condensé winner, c'est juste demander que cette relation-là ait un maximum, mais de manière générale, elle a pas envie d'être transmise. Et en fait, ça, c'est la, la merde de tous les mots, en fait. C'est la source de, de, de tous nos problèmes. En fait. Donc euh, là, bon, bah, tu, tu, demandes, tu demandes à un système de vote de faire quelque chose qui n'a pas envie, en ton et puis, euh, bon, y a, y a, y a, y a, ça, ça se fait à fuir par un côté, quoi. Euh, ouais, le, le, le... On dorsait, on aurait envie que ça marche, mais euh, bon, ça marche pas. Ça, 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 ça. Déjà, c'est miraculeux, mais je suis déjà miraculeux ça, que ça marche pas. Ça marche pas. Ah, même il y a des choses qui sont bien. Alors, moi, j'avais une petite remarque, mais c'est juste pour critiquer le papier de Denis. <rire> euh, c'est quand il parcourt les tournaments, là, j'ai. J'ai l'impression mmh. quand même que pour parfois tous les tournaments, il y a un algo qui est un peu pour un et qui a fait un peu subtil. Euh, bah, en fait, ça, c'est juste euh, avec le. Non, 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 quand tu euh, reviens. Ah, là Là Non, encore. Euh, là. Là voilà. Ah Là, essentiellement, si je comprends bien, pour euh, constituer les tournois à cas voteur, mmh. 
en fait, il prend tous les tournois à K-1 moteur, oui. il essaye de rajouter un, un électeur n'importe où, et oui. puis il regarde quand même si c'est un tournoi qu'il a déjà obtenu. Oui, c'est ça. Alors que quand même, fondamentalement, euh, un tournoi à K moteur, ou en tout cas un tournoi, un tournoi avec au plus N moteur, ça revient juste à assigner des poids sur les arêtes de façon à ce que les poids alors, soit valent K, soit soient inférieurs ou égal à N. Et ça, tu peux le faire sans avoir à, à checker le doublon, en fait, en réalité. Oui, mais là, je pense qu'en l'occurrence, il fait ça juste pour avoir ce truc-là et avoir directement ce truc-là sous la main et, et pouvoir écrire ça rapidement, peut-être. Donc, d'avoir le, le ranking qu'il a rajouté, quoi. Ben. Je pense que c'est pour ça. Parce qu'en fait, il est obligé ah oui, d'écrire ça, ça, même si c'est pris, il n'a pas de déjà... participation. Il a oui. besoin de cette relation. Oui, c'est ça. Il veut faire toutes les paires qui consistent oui. à ajouter un électeur de toute façon. Oui. Il pas ajouter le réalisateur. Oui. Je ne sais pas. Je ne sais pas. Questions on the bridge Okay, so I think we can thank the speaker again. Thank you.